good afternoon, everybody. And good afternoon to our audience out there in the world on Zoom. Uh, my name is Martin Hagen. I am the interim director of the Center for Armenian Studies for this year. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's event. Um, before we start, I would like to uh, draw your attention to an upcoming event here at the Center um, on Friday, November 4th. We will have a whole day workshop on the modern state and internal colonialism. And we're pleased to have organizers here. Um Larson and Gerard Sargent. It's going to be an um, all day interdisciplinary panel. Um, and this will also be available on the website. And then um, on December um, 7th, Friday, uh, on Wednesday, we'll have a visiting lecture by Karen Garcian um, about language as the casualty of war. So please um, um, watch out for further analysis uh, on this. And um, if you haven't yet, please. Um, we get consider signing up for our website <laughs> and for our um, alert. That being said, <clears throat> um, it is my great pleasure uh, today to introduce our, as our guest uh, one of the leading scholars of Armenian history in this country, Professor Pedro Sermantosian, <clears throat> who was born and raised in East Jerusalem and graduated from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem <coughs> and then obtained his PhD at the University uh, at, at Columbia University, uh, has taught at MIT and the University of Chicago before moving to the University of um, <coughs> Nebraska Lincoln, where he's the vice chair and associate professor of modern Middle East history and the Hans Rosenberg Professor in Judaic Studies. <coughs> he's also the president of the uh, uh, Society for Armenian Studies. Um, uh, Professor Damagosian has been an amazingly productive scholar. Um, he's the author of an award-winning book, Shattered Dreams of Revolution, From Liber Liberty to Violence in the Late Ottoman Empire, that came out from Stanford in 2014. He has um, edited a volume on the First Republic of Armenia on its centenary, um, Politics, Gender, and Diplomacy, and co edited a book that I'm going to uh, National Library as soon as I can get to it. Um, they brought this handbook on Jerusalem, which he co edited with Suleiman Murad and Alvay Colson Brock. Um, he's also the editor of a new series, Armenians in the Modern and Early Modern World, um, published by Ivy Forrest and Open Story Press. Today, however, <coughs> um, we will um, hear more about his most recent work um, <coughs> that raises um, some essential questions for the understanding of the gen uh, Armenian Genocide, um, the context of a growth of ethnic tensions, the role of rumors and commotion, contestations of the public fear, <coughs> um, illuminating how and why ordinary people can become perpetrators. And he does that not the events of 1950 himself, but in a historical analysis of the massacres of Abba in 1909. Which is not some micro history per se, there's still after all 20,000, more than 20,000 victims. Mm -hmm. But this um, cataclysmic event has been most eclipsed by 1915 and has been much neglected in um, um, recent historical scholarship. So we write those for him for writing out a new book, 2022, mm -hmm. on, um, uh, on this, and he will share some of his findings with us today. Please. Thank you. 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 
So I analyze from the perspective of analyze the Mahogana uh, massacres to the school interrelated themes. First of all, public and support for Boston public spheres. Of course, I'm not going to go into detail about public spheres, which is mentioned in my book. Uh, Habermas, the critique of Habermas, uh, 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 Ryan, uh, uh, Fraser, uh, Justine, all of these criticize uh, the exclusionary aspect of Habermas' uh, public spheres, which confined only to the four things. And they raise the issue that there are other multiple public spheres that exist within, uh, within different societies. These are marginalized, sometimes women, uh, sometimes uh, non dominant groups, sometimes by other ethnic groups, and we see this happening in the same case of the Ottoman Empire. Mind you that I do not take the, the European model of public sphere and apply it to the Ottoman Empire. Because uh, the European Union was different, the Ottoman Union was different. It doesn't mean that we have to follow European models and explain issues within history within the Middle East. For example, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, such public speech did exist in coffee houses or coffee shops, for example, uh, and eventually we see the rise of public sphere in the, uh, with the uh, introduction of print capitalism in the Ottoman Empire, and the there are a major public sphere, and there are also subaltern public spheres, minor public spheres. I mean, have their own public sphere, their own community, and the, uh, and, and the others have their own public spheres. Second, rumors are extremely important in order to understand the ways in which these massacres took place. Not only these rumors do not apply only to the other massacres, but I'm going to show that rumors are part and parcel. So part and there are a part and parcel of every massacre that took place in the course of history in the Middle period. From Sikh massacres to the Odessa massacres, from Baba Shabdullah to other massacres, respectively. Emotions are extremely important aspects of understanding massacres. Uh, emotion based and analysis has been marginalized in the historiography of the Middle East in general, or also the Empire in particular, too, where uh, usually people do not use emotion. But emotions are important aspects of understanding why perpetrators, why groups erupt in cataclysmic violence in order to take revenge over the, uh, the other. The other. So emotions are extremely important. Last but not least, humanitarianism and humanitarian intervention is an important aspect that highlights also is highlighted in the uh, in the other analysis. I'm just going to now provide a brief description of what I'm talking about. By public spheres, I argue that public spheres provide an important medium for the enactment of social identities and can be seen as a medium that precipitates at the religious tension between dominant and non-dominant groups. Tensions that many that may manifest as violence, including massacres. Think of it, we are talking in a post-revolution period. Prior to the uh, Young Turk Revolution of 1908, public sphere was extremely easy in censorship of the hands of massacres. What the public sphere did actually, or what the Young Turk Revolution did, was open a large public sphere where everyone now became uh, an important component of this public sphere, debating the future of the empire, debating the uh, the uh, current situation as to what needs to be done. So it was an unrestrained public sphere that everyone started discussing about their own future. So the book is, uh, discusses in detail about what I mean with public sphere and how it led to the, uh, to the escalation of tension. Second, rumors are extremely important aspects of understanding the other than that question. As Peterson and Jess provide, uh, define rumors as an unverified account or an explanation of events circulating from one person to person and pertaining to an object, event, or issue of public concern. Rumors solidify the boundaries of the crowd, giving them a sense of bonding and affirming their authenticity while pre preparing them for an imminent violent onslaught with other groups. Rumors are part of modern history, are part, part of the present. Think about this country, think about how mediums of technology today play a dominant role in dissemination of rumors. I'm going to discuss what I mean by rumors and other ideas. Emotions, again, play a dominant role. Emotions are powerful social and political forces that can be harnessed and shaped in the service of collective action. When the emotions are high, and it's high, emotions are really in a very uh, heightened situation, agents provocateurs or interest groups 
can mobilize and exploit and manipulate these emotions in order to achieve a achieve their aim. In the context of political upheaval, such as you know, counter revolution or revolution, emotions often motivate people towards violent action by creating the us versus them mentality. And last but not least, humanitarian and humanitarian intervention. There's a difference between humanitarianism and humanitarian intervention. Humanitarian intervention, according to Davide Otokno, is a coercive, diplomatic, and armed action against mass effort undertaken by a state or a group of states inside the territory of the target state. Its main motivation is to end mass efforts, atrocity, and extermination, or to prevent repetition of such events. It is an ex post facto event whose objective is to protect civilian population, mistreated, and protected by the target state government agent and other authority. And in the case of the uh, other massacres, no humanitarian intervention took place. In the case of the Hamidah massacres, no humanitarian intervention took place because it did not serve the European interest. Whereas in the case of Lebanon, in the case of Greece, in the case of Greek, Greece, the, this type of intervention. This was the first book that I wrote about the Young Turk Revolution. I say the other massacre is the sequel because the Young Turk Revolution is extremely important in order to understand what happened to the uh, other massacre. So let's flash back to the, uh, to the, uh, this is the cover of the book, to the history. Of course, medievalists, you know what map is this? This is the map of the, uh, oh, I mean, broadly. The army was initial in 1911 and 1775. And Adana, of course, is mostly part of the uh, of the Silesian Kingdom. Better. Now, with the with the uh, with the in the pre-revolutionary period and post-revolutionary period. Rumors spread around that our new revolutionaries in the end of the 19th century aimed at revolting in other lands in order to create and reestablish the kingdom of Asia. Don't underestimate the power of rumors because these rumors spread in the pre revolutionary period and in the post revolutionary period where the public sphere was uh, open and Armenians now enjoyed their cultural nationalism towards and poetry, and uh, it eventually sending kind of one messages to the uh, conservative elements within Adana, the country of revolutionaries, who now believe that this is a larger part of the Armenian conspiracy to establish the kingdom of Indonesia. Now, I argue that there are long term causes and short term causes of these massacres. Long term, long -term causes took place in the context of the administrative reform during the time of the period where the where the provinces were re administered according to the political situation. Second, centralization and pacification of the tribes, which is again part of the country much reform to centralize uh, the government centralized taxation system. Third, influx of refugees resulting in competition over resources, new refugees came, Muslim refugees came from uh, the Caucasus, most of them, from Crimea, and they were settled in areas within Adana where Armenians were populated, thus creating what we saw in so niche overlap, competition over resources. Third, changes in the land code, but specifically in this past year, the uh, 1868 land code, uh, we were discussing about land code earlier, land, land code earlier, which aimed at extracting direct taxes from the farmers by removing the mediator the notables. But eventually it was counterproductive, where the land where the farmers were not were afraid to pay taxes, because that meant, all, meant also they would be constricted, and hence ended up uh, selling their land to the landlords. It was counterproductive. So the beneficiary, one of the beneficiaries of these landlords were our means to, they ended up buying large tracts of land in the region of Adana. And one of the most important gaps, it's not the most important, one of the most important aspects is the economic development that took place in the 19th century. Adana, as a whole, 
is one of the most important tech sections in the Ottoman Empire for the carpet production. So uh, at least after Egypt, as a matter of fact, after Egypt. And this important rises after the Ameri American Civil War of 1861, leading to the shift of the European interest, because there was a decline in the uh, supply of cotton in the south here. There was a shift to Egypt and the Ottoman Empire for, uh, uh, for supplying cotton. And Europeans began investing a lot. German companies, French, British companies in the region of the Silesia, of Chikorova, so larger region. Uh, Armenians played a dominant role, establishing factories and bringing new machinery of harvesting and killing to others. So they were kind of now rising bourgeoisie class or urban music class. Another important thing that we have to understand with this economic importance is that other than now became part of the global economy, you know, supplying cotton to different parts of the world. But also one thing we have to remember that other than I had two seasons in, uh, in the cotton industry, harvesting and killing. Killing to take to place in April, the month of April, and harvesting to take on October. And annually, around 120,000 migrant workers will come to Adana to work on the field. Out of 120,000, maybe 40, 40 to 30,000 of them were Armenian. They were itinerant laborers who come from uh, Ankara, from uh, Konya, from Sivas, from uh, Aleppo, many other places, worked for ex extensively for three weeks or four weeks, get paid, and return back. And that would be that, that that was sufficient for their annual uh, labor, annual you know, living so, uh, on the annual basis. But with the introduction of the implement of modernization, cotton production, killing, all the wood on the machine, you're already you're already cutting the daily bread of these migrant workers who came from two backgrounds. So here is one of the important transformations that is that are taking in other. And uh, so there's also a lot of anger between landlords and migrant workers. Imagine, so during the month of April, more than 100,000 people are pulled into the city of Adana, Hozan, and all the other places working or looking for work. So cotton played an important, important uh, role. Think of cotton as, a, as, as, as this, you know, white, if I call called the uh, 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 the white gold, uh, because of its importance and its price. And uh, these are just images of people working in the, uh, in the, in the plane. Of course, there are, uh, there are many types of cotton, you know, but there is the, 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 the American cotton. Uh, after 1861, the government started uh, um, providing seeds, American seeds. To be hard to be uh, to be you know to be uh, to be uh, to the farmers in the region of other than other places like in the Middle East. Families spending cotton in other so the family venture. You know, people would would uh, till the cotton, work on the cotton, and then and then uh, tear it in the basement of the or on the underground in the basement of their of their houses. When it comes to short term causes, these are three actually. The Young Turk Revolution of 1908. The importance of the Young Turk Revolution of 1908, of course, French Revolution, uh, the French Revolution, and also symbolism had huge impact in the Young Turk Revolution. But the revolutionary Young Turk Revolution used the, uh, used the French Revolution within a historic perspective. It wasn't problematic, but it was extremely problematic revolution, the bloody revolution. And uh, so they took it with an historic approach. Uh, but the Young Turk Revolution also created major dissatisfied elements, who is called now Antonovsky, who belongs to the large landowning classes, large uh, beneficiaries of the Hamilton regime, regime and large, well, a large class of bureaucrats that belong to the Hamilton regime. And hence, you have created now a major imbalance in power 
were doing the handling theory, which was finely tuned that balance that existed before uh, the Ottoman Empire. What the Young Turk theory does, or the Young Turk vision does, it creates the rupture. It, 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 it disrupts the finely tuned balance that existed, creating both new, becoming a double edged sword, creating freedom and liberty to those who were oppressed for 30 years by the Hanzi regime, but also creating major disgruntled elements now who are unhappy with the Young Turks and their co conspirators, the Armenians, who work with the Young Turks in, the, in order to realize the revolution. The second aspect is the public sphere that emerged. Public sphere, as I said, is an extremely important uh, accelerator of the ethnic tension. The public sphere in the Ottoman Empire opened Pandora's box of ethnic tension, but also it was so it was also a time of breathing, let's say, of cultural nationalism. Armenians in, in, in Tunisia now began practicing their uh, regular rights, I should say, uh, putting together theatrical to presentations, uh, old poetry, lectures. Armenian clandestine parties now became more and more active such as the Hanshakian party, such as the ARF, Armenian Revolutionary Party, Russia, and buying weapons became one of the important, let's say, uh, 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 important aspects of this new post revolution period. Muslims were buying weapons, Armenians were buying weapons, large amounts. And I really wanted to check in my research whether this buying of weapons was intentional in order to implement the prophecy, and the prophecy was that Armenians are buying weapons, establish the same institution. Muslims were buying weapons, Armenians were buying weapons. And I went to the Dashnak archives, and I examined all these, uh, all these correspondences. Uh, and there wasn't any hint about a revolution to establish the kingdom of Tisha. What I found is the is that they were buying weapons, they needed weapons for the sole purpose of self-defense in Because Armenians knew that this young Turk revolution is shaky. Abdel Hamid might get back with a counter-revolution, and that counter-revolution had to be ready against uh, an onslaught by the counter-revolution. Third is the counter-revolution of April 13, 1909. The counter revolution took place, of course, in Istanbul in 1909. Uh, 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 of course, it's not as easy as but it's actually uh, uh, not uh, Marco but it's uh, actually April 15, 1909, where the counter revolution was now initiated the coup, uh, which lasted about a few days uh, to get rid of the young church. And of course, uh, for many years, people have mistakenly. Um, Attributed the top counter revolution to the conservative forces, but Islam and uh, Islamic supporters. But it's not that actually the counter revolution was uh, uh, was the result of post of uh, interest groups, including liberals, including uh, Muslim uh, Muslim scholars, with the sole aim of getting rid of the authoritarianship of the monitors. Now let's go back in the during the 19 during the Hamid period. Because the prophecy starts in the hand of This and I believe that, and I don't never say believe as a story, I think that story, I, I think that agency plays a dominant role in all major transformations. Agency. If we think about matters, we think about movements, but these movements are not going to move, are not going to do anything without leaders. This is a, this is Mishel Mushek Serokia, who was the most important active religious political figure in Adana. He was a Hunchak revolutionary before he was appointed. Actually, uh, they called him revolutionary in the Ottoman Turkish sources, but I said maybe that the Turkish the tradition, but when I read his unpublished memoirs, he said I was a revolutionary, but I had a problem with the part I left the party. He comes to Adana, and there are even correspondences by the Adana uh, governor the center or vice versa, saying that we should keep an eye on this guy, he's a very problematic figure. 
But Bush, we should have, Bush, we should have said that Oka actually was you know, on very good terms with Bashir Pasha, the governor of Oka. And they were really working together hand in hand on improving the army laws in Oka. And uh, as a result of this, for example, of this uh, cooperation, uh, the Armenians were able to establish this fascinating market with schools here and all, all Armenian markets, and they called it the Bashir Pasha market. Bahi Pasha Tashifu, uh, in tribute to uh, Bahi Pasha. One thing we have to remember that not everyone, every governor during the Hamid period was an evil person. You had good people, you had bad people. You had evil governors, you had benevolent governors. So what they did of church too is that they removed everyone, regardless, and they put their own people on the, on the position. When they were successful in doing that with all the provinces, in the case of Adana, they were successful. Javad Bey becomes the body of Adana. He is, uh, he is part and parcel of the Asian regime, and he creates a circle around him, represented by, uh, by Ottoman notables, specifically uh, Ali Gajar Izadeh and Abu Khadir Baghdad Izadeh, who now starts fighting with the other group. The other group is not Armenian, not Armenian. But the young Turks. So similar to other provinces, we see this tension between the young Turks and the people of the Ancien Regime. But this, in this case, in the case of Adana, that person of the Ancien Regime is the body of Adana. Another important figure is Garabet Gusterella. Garabet Gusterella, who I was just reading this uh, section, who was, uh, uh, was deported actually to uh, to the uh, to the concentration camps in Syria to the Iranian genocide, he was a major figure in Adana, who is still feared among the hearts of Muslims because uh, of his personality. He was a lawyer. He was the uh, appeals court uh, president of the appeals court, major figure and the large landowner. And he was imprisoned actually during the Hamidian period for under suspicion for killing one of the fleet uh, superintendents. And then he was released, of course, eventually he was released and escaped to Cyprus, but then he returned back after the uh, other man. Thomas Sigurd, who had serious problems with this figure, Abu Khadr Baghdad Izadeh. It's a huge difficult to find these types of images. I, I just found it after I published the book, now uh, check, checking the internet left, right, and even even finding uh, finding him, uh, even finding Barabet with Terelia was really difficult. So Abdul Qadir Baghdad is a major figure, landowner in Adana, who was uh, very pro anti regime, anti young church. And uh, the other important figure here that also played a key role in the political system was uh, Ehsan Sikri. Mahmoud Ehsan, Ehsan Sikri, the editor of the Etidal newspaper and the leader of the young church in Adana. One thing we have to remember also, trying to think about how the young church revolution uh, uh, was, what it was implemented in the provinces, that these were at the beginning young church leaders. There are, there are many people among the, uh, among the provinces who just jumped on the bandwagon of the young church revolution. Ehsantik is one of them, he declared himself as a young church, sent a telegram to the center in Salonika saying that now I'm younger and I'm taking your uh, blessings to establish here the cell within, uh, you know, uh, cell of the party within the, uh, within the, uh, within the, uh, within the This is the uh, important event. It's the, uh, it's the art of history in Adana they established during the revolution. Now, all of this is happening all of these uh, tensions are similarly prior to the revolution, right? This, is, this was established during the Hamidian period. And also, Abdul Qadir was against, I should say, against, against Pasi Pasha. They hated each other. So there is all these intricate interpersonal relationships which manifest itself also in the other massacres. Again, massacres are not, uh, you know, are not, uh, are very complex phenomena. We have the personalities involved. Agents is important. Armenians were not solely the victims. They also fought to the defense of 
when I understood that the figures I've argued, 20,000 Armenians, around uh, 15 to 2,000. So, the Young Turk Revolution changed a lot of things. Buying of weapons, publishing, Musha himself, the bishop now, walking in public ceremony, wearing his, wearing his, uh, you know, his, his vest, and for the regular person on the street, they started thinking that he had put his, his uh, monarchical dress as a king himself, all right? And they bring several, uh, several uh, uh, testimonies and several, uh, uh, several facts to support their claim. Uh, one of the claims was uh, a theatric representation which was put in mercy in the coastal town by Armenians, uh, which dealt with the uh, media period. Uh, and it was called Timurlane and the uh, and Sisa and Sibat or something, where the Armenian kingdom is shackled, uh, Armenian king is in the prison, uh, shackled with, you know, with the islands and, you know, and uh, then the king and, and dream, the dream that uh, an angel comes to him and says, you will be you'll be liberated soon and uh, you'll be able to establish your kingdom, etc., etc. And then apparently, after the theatric presentation ended, Armenians stood up and shouted, Long live Armenia, long live Armenia, Armenia. Now, for, for a long period of time, I, I doubted about this, this presentation, with this theatric presentation, but then once, 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 uh, once I was doing research at the National Association of Armenian Studies and Research, and I found that was true, yeah, that was Surya, the uh, Armenian, uh, you know, he died, uh, uh, he's an Armenian poet, who died very early, like in his early 20s, at the time, 19, who wrote the, who wrote the theatrical piece called, you know, the Timur Lane and Siba, it's the same theatrical piece. But after 10 years, when I did my research in the uh, private archives of private, uh, you know, memoirs of Michel, he said, yes, we used this, but we toned down the we really, you know, summarize it in such a way that it would not touch harm the senses of the of the Muslim population. All right. So look how things turn around. And that was true. And when did he die? I think it was the second half of the 80s or 90s of the 19th century. If I'm not mistaken. Similar in Tarsus, for example, the American College, the Protestant American College in Tarsus, they put a uh, theatrical presentation where uh, they played Hamlet, and again, was Hamlet killed, or someone was killed? Hamlet was killed, then. Yes. Yeah. And then the, uh, the missionary said, once Hamlet was killed, all the dignitaries, the missionary dignitaries started standing, and stopped. they became really anxious about this is the message that they're going to kill. Of course, you have cultural nationalism, and then that's also being represented as a... As a. So, like every any other every other massacre, the first wave of massacres took place as a result of one skirmish between a Muslim, between Armenian and Syrian. In the Armenian quarter of Shabaniya, this is around April 11, I think, and the Armenian apparently killed one of the Muslims. And the funeral of that Muslim played an important role in mobilization of the masses because the identity and the ethnic background of the killer, the Armenian by the name of Oban, became generalized as this is an Armenian stuff. Second day, the second Muslim died, and they weren't able to catch Oban, who apparently was hidden and allowed to escape to Cyprus by no one else than Garbet or Terelian, who is still here among the Muslim population. The Young Turk, the, the counter revolution news comes to Adana and it, it erupts into a major wave of violence. Armenians put the defense, defended their Armenian culture, they had weapons. The Muslims attacked the Armenians. Of course, when I say Muslim, I don't, I don't necessarily think that this is a religiously motivated thing. That's why it's complex. You can never say this is a Muslim versus Christian problem. The, the mob, let's say, consisted of Cherkes, Hezahi, who were 
uh, who were uh, Egyptian, actually, uh, Egyptian peasants who working in Havana, uh, 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 ruffians from the neighborhood criminals, but also some of the police played an important role. The governor of Adana, when the disturbances of the massacre start, sends a telegram to the center in Istanbul telling them that everything is out of, out of situation, out of control. What should I do immediately? You know? So he sends a letter, uh, Adil Bey, on the secretary of the, uh, from Istanbul, sends send, send a telegram saying, make sure, not every other thing, make sure protect the foreign institutions in that. To back. To back. And of course, from Armenian perspective, they think that this is a euphemism that says protect Armenia, protect the Europeans, but kill the Armenians. Right. I don't think it's that way it should be. Anyway, so Javed is impotent, in, in, impotent, is unable to deal with the situation. The first wave of massacre ends when Armenians agree to hand in their weapons. The ratio is between 1,500 to 400, 1,500 to 400 and 1,500 are in the ratio of the city of Adana. Now, the Adana massacre is not about the city of Adana. Now, the rumors start spreading all over the province. And what's the rumors? That Armenians revolting in Adana, killing all the Muslims, and are on the way to establish the kingdom of Phoenicia. That's what Phoenicia is important, the past history is important to understand how things are uh, turned out. And the, why the massacres are halted in Adana, they could see, it continues all over our, all, all the other places. In Tarsi, for example, the, uh, uh, the occasions of the Matubo district, the Irregulars, what he was, he had seen with them. Taking the Tarsus train all the way to uh, uh, Tarsus to uh, burn the city, and they do burn many, many uh, parts of the Armenian inhabited area. Uh, the other massacres go all the way around, sorry, I'm just going to show you something here. The map are spread all over the, all over the area, so it's Koza. Uh, worst case is, uh, is, uh, uh, of course, Adana, but uh, uh, Sandra of Adana, Hajen, Shebenli, uh, sorry, Tarsus, uh, Mersin, is, uh, Jabal Barakat is the worst place that suffers. Rochelan is pulled also to the province of Aleppo. Places like Istanbul, Antakya, Antet, Marash, uh, Zaytun, of course, is in the zone of defense, and the uh, Hassan of the city of Zaytun. And uh, uh, what the uh, the, uh, the governor of Aleppo, Rashid Pacha, is able to handle the situation and immediately stops everything before it gets fine. Now, when the first wave of massacres ended, the, uh, 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 when the first wave of massacres ended, uh, uh, there was a period of truce, right? And uh, the government takes the decision that they would send three battalions to Adana in order to preserve law and order. Armenians are elated at this time that finally the officers are sending a new battalion that's going to preserve law and order. I argue that in this inter massacre period between April 16 to April, to April 25, the public sphere was not restrained. In such situations, of course, violent uh, uh, phases, the public sphere should be restrained in order to stop any escalation of the situation. What Ehsan Fikri, the young Turk leader, does is he now publishes in the Etidan newspaper, issue number 33, here, an astonishing archive where he writes in detail now, confirming the prophecy. In detail, think of it. Rumors are rumors when they're spread. But if you're just a simple person, you don't have critical mind, you know, when you see a rumor written, you start believing it. Then they say, well, so what did you hear about this? He says, it wasn't was Facebook at the time. Similar thing. If he writes a series of 
Farsi Credency and his colleagues, creditors, Burhan Nuri, Ismail Safari Jad, and others start writing by preparing, by demonstrating the roadmap that are being practiced. What is the roadmap? They start population, population is initial, they harvest revolutionary, they started accumulating weapons, and they put theatrical presentation to do that as a, as a group. They shouted, Long live Armenia and the Kingdom of Cilicia, etc. Now, this played a prominent role in shaping the public opinion at all. Because it was spread around, you know, in the, uh, in the Ottoman period in the Middle East, also, you know, the way in which these figures were read. I mean, we don't have the statistical data as to how many people read. We know that it was one person, a literate, literate person, who was reading these would sit in the coffee shop and read the newspaper and everyone. This played a dominant role in inciting the public uh, for the onslaught of the Second World War. So, April 24th, 25th, the three battalions come and establish their camp in our land. Leading to a second wave of massacres, which was much more brutal in Adana than the first one. Maybe for two days, Armenian houses were burnt, and uh, since Armenians were out of weapons, they weren't able to defend themselves. And eventually, the second wave of massacres took place. If you see images from Adana at the time, it looks like World War II, Paris, or London. The whole situation, the whole, the whole Armenian culture is destroyed. It has to go also with the, with the structure of the building. Uh, the structure of the building, you know, it's clay maybe, from stone, but wooden plank covers the, uh, the roof. And once that wooden plank collapses, the whole thing collapses. And most of these houses were burnt down. Uh, again here, and of course, uh, humanitarianism did take place, you know, in major European powers. Uh, the Ottoman government sent uh, 30,000 gold euros, etc., etc. So, uh, so I'm not going to discuss about the humanitarian uh, event or humanitarian space or humanitarian effort. But one thing we have to remember is that the prophecy was that Armenians are going to revolt, European powers are going to intervene and help Armenians to establish the human solution. Well, the American uh, cruisers were there, the British cruisers were there, the German cruisers were there, the, the French cruisers were there, no one to do. And you see our report, what they, some of they said, if we intervene, the situation would be worse, right? No one intervened. So what type of process are we thinking? So, but also, within historical research, sometimes you can find more about what happened afterwards than what happened during the war. The Ottoman government decided to send two investigation commissions. One of them was the government commission, by Bey and Harachim Mosichan. And the other one is the part of the commission, Akhov Babikian and Yusuf Jamalde. It's in Armenian and the Muslim, or the Turk. I don't know if you don't know if it's Turk or not. I just got along with the Muslim. Uh, Harish Pai. These are very prominent figures. Specifically, Akhov Babikian is a member of this commission, the young church member. Akhov Babikian is an interesting figure. He was chosen because I think he was the less less quote-unquote nationalist, he was in interfering on in political affairs. He was his loyalty was more to the TV. Babigan comes to Adana and leaves early, investigates and leaves early. He's upset. He writes an 80 pages report in Ottoman that was supposed he was supposed to testify in the Ottoman Parliament about what he saw. Three days before his testimony, he died. In mysterious, in mysterious circumstances, they say. I've read interviews of her daughter, which was, uh, which took place in Paris. And, uh, she said that two young church leaders came to talk to him and they gave him a cigarette two days before so that it was possibly, it was poison. We don't know that actually. Uh, because there was an autopsy of the body, uh, they said he was invited. Nevertheless, what is that report? We, to today, we don't have that report. What we have is selected versions of smaller reports being published in 1915, 
and the Armenian version was only published in 1990. Where if you see, if you read that, it would say that the young Turks were responsible too. Of course, I argue that the young Turks are responsible too, but the young Turks of the comments about that, you don't have a proof that the young Turks of the Central Committee was involved in in uh, in implementing these massacres. One thing we, we have to remember that I have to remember that I do not fall in the continuum approach, which argues that the Armenian genocide was the white product of the larger wave of mass violence that took place. So, you know, some even other than stuff argues that the other massacres were the suppression ratio. It's a much complex phenomenon that we need to think of. So apparently there's a story that uh, when he died, our units came from the patriarchy, did the lithograph, took a copy, and took it, took it back to the Armenian patriarchy, never published it and published it. So it's an interesting, curious case, but we don't have much even really thought about writing uh, a lengthy article about him, but we don't have much uh, kind of resources with it. Of course, the Ottoman, the Austrian government now in power has to show to the world that it is uh, it is pro institution, pro law. And of course, in my first book, I also argue that the Young Turk government, the Young Turk Party or the CDP has used constitutionalism, has used the liberty, freedom, or they have used constitutionalism uh, in order to keep the territorial integrity in the Ottoman Empire. They were authoritarian powers. Uh, they, or they, their, their uh, mode of operation was through extra-legal and extra-constitutional uh, uh, methods. So, immediately after the massacre, the local court, national local court is established by some of the uh, perpetrators, and what they do immediately, they put 200 Muslims, 150 Muslims, Armenians into the prison, and investigate with Armenians, and forcefully, under torture, take uh, a confession, a temple confession, that it was Musha's plan to, uh, to revolt and establish a new institution. Meanwhile, Musha is not in Adam's life. He's in Egypt fundraising with the AGDU for establishing a high school, uh, an artisan high school in Adana. He takes the ship immediately both brought it to Adana, but they prevent him to, you know, to enter Adana in fear of more expedition. And that was the last time that they were tried to enter to the region. After that, we left to Paris and the yeah, court for Manchester. So the local court martial immediately issued a statement saying this was an Armenian plot to establish a thing in Tunisia, etc., etc. And then Armenians protest, and there was a lot of uh, problems and, you know, uh, uh, escalation of tensions, the patriarchy says I'm resigning, etc. Now the government takes the decision to send a proper court martial under the presidency of, of Kenan Pasha. Sorry. What happened? So what Kenan Pasha does is come to Adana and takes all the old investigation reports that were done on the local with the local court martial. He said, buy it, he said, paint it, it's corrupt. Instead of starting afresh, he continues with the same mantra that this is what what we've done. That our means of planning, the right of fighting, etc. Who sabotages all of this is Babi Diyan. Babi Diyan now starts Take, making statements that, you know, Kenan Pasha is really wrong in his statement and he is really messing up with the situation. I know for a fact few people who were convicted were not at the event, they were hiding in the in the, in the, in the German bank, right? So immediately there is a lot of uproar in Istanbul about Kenan Pasha and Kenan Pasha resigns at the conference. And then finally, Ismail Fadrin Kenan Pasha is sent to Adana to convict the real conference. I'm going to talk about the types of crimes that were perpetrated. We have murder, we have extortion, rape, and arson. Of course, the whole city was burned. And now the real question is that was there justice? And this is a larger question that we need to ask in different matters. 
is there, what is the real justice? Where is the real con convicted people? Where is the real culprit? Where is the culprit convicted? Now, it comes to the following analogy. Do you, do you accuse or indict the bullet who was fired, which was fired from a gun or the person who uh, fired the gun or triggered with the thing on the trigger? They ask me the person who was in the trigger. Because most of them, some of them were instrumental, even Muslims who were, uh, who were 40 to 50 Muslims were hanged, were hung. So totally we have 347 people who were convicted. The convictions were between 15 days, temporary exile, imprisonment, total banishment, death sentence. Alright? Six Armenians were hanged, and about 30 to 40 Muslims were also, were also received the capital punishment. Some of them were innocent. But the real culprits were not. These include Ismail Seba, Javid Pasha, the governor of the Abdul Qadir Fazal Zadeh, Gagali, uh, Ali Gagali Zadeh, not the most of So the real figures were not tried and received, they were tried actually, but received very light sentence. Javad Pasha, for example, was denied of any administrative position at the end of his life. Uh, Adil, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Ismail Sefa, not Ismail Sefa, sorry, uh, the editor of, of the Itizan newspaper was banished, and he died in Beirut a few months later. He was banished to Ankara, and then he went to Istanbul, and then went to uh, Cairo, and he complained about the situation. And uh, eventually, the individual and the world uh, hand in the battle. Now, towards the end, I'd like to discuss one important thing with the uh, I, I do not believe that, in this case, that humans are naturally disposed to be violent people. I believe that circumstances, situations, allow people to commit unthinkable crimes. There is no biological predisposition or religious predisposition of any religion that promotes violence. Not that because they were Muslim, they were some violent religion. Not that they were Christian or in different cases. What we see in the cases, in other cases, such as the, what interests me actually is structural violence and the way in which massacres are carried out. Massacres are not aberration, they are rational, rational events that take place at the beginning and the end. And if you see different massacres, such as the Odessa and the Sikh massacres, uh, the, 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 uh, I, uh, I described to the end of the conclusion, they have the similar structures. Interest groups, rumors, police participation, and black but not least black or justice. Even the Holocaust is like that. About 30 people were charged with death. Massive amount of people were fatally escaped in the Nazi regime. Most of them, maybe half of them, during the Latin American escape, were uh, passport, and they were given by the, uh, by the Catholic Church. I'm interested in structural violence and actors. To that extent, if you really want justice, I don't think there is, there is justice in our understanding that justice needs to be done. There wasn't justice in the case of. Uh, in the case of Adana, there wasn't justice in the case of uh, the Odessa massacres. Worse, the community report actually blamed the victim of instigating the massacres. Here's the thing if you are the powerful entity, then you have the power to define what the act is. Hence, everyone calls it a riot. The massacre becomes riot. Right? Similar to the Adana case similar to the uh, Sikh massacres, and similar to the Odessa massacres. The Sikh massacres, for example, which was triggered by the assassination of Indira Gandhi by her two Sikh bodyguards, triggered a massive wave of violence against the Sikhs in Punjab and in Delhi, uh, leading to the massacre of about 10,000 people, until the late, until the late, the late century. Until 1990, 2000, 
for commission after commission, investigation after investigation, the whole world will be caught. Police will protest it. At least in the other massacres, the government announced that Armenians are not to be blamed. They were innocent, and this was not, they did not have any information to establish a new tradition or activity. So, last but not least, this study is an extraordinary, as you have heard, it's a discipline study where we have, we have to understand the such things that massacre is that human behavior in psychology, uh, mob mentality is extremely important to understand how interest groups, how by young provocateurs use the poor mass stuff. I mean, masses of where migrant workers, their education, etc. But this does not mean that they should be kind of, it should be conditions of victim that they will be murdered or perpetrated. They are perpetrated. But more important for me to think how such a society is in the public sector. Thank you so much. Very thought provoking and in depth uh, talk. Are you willing to field questions? Well, of course. I mean, I want it's, to such say a complex, it's such a complex thing is that it cannot be, you know, I, this is not a definitive book because the, the magnitude of the events of this matter, but it cannot provide definitive. It's each city, it's each village, you can write a book. Yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to watch the. Um, uh, interesting question from, from, from our online uh, participants. Um, oh, my and, but yeah, let's start with those in, in, in the room here. Sure. Um, thank you so much for a really fascinating talk and really masterful work. Um, I have a question about, I am really right about your book in the beginning when you're sort of decoupling. What was she? I have a question about, uh, something you write about in your book uh, in the beginning when you're decoupling massacre studies and massacre from the category of genocide, you know, where one is, you know, to wipe out a group of people and all our parts, yes. and the other is really like a, a mechanism of intimidation. And discipline, yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious if you could extend for us uh, this story a little bit by years or, or decades and um, say something about does the intimidation work and how would you measure it? Uh, you know, do Armenians stop? Walking through the streets in the regalia of, you know, clerical um, outfits, or you know, is there a different kind of discourse that circulates about Cilicia in our meaning yes. vehicles, or is there a cultural shift? How would you measure um, intimidation? Of course, it's very difficult because yeah. we would have uh, uh, we would have opinion polls yeah. that people what do they think? But I mean, if you think about intimidation, it's uh, in the Armenian case, it's kind of one sheep in the other. You have violence, and then you have counter violence by Armenian revolutionaries. And uh, you know, here's the thing: uh, I do not, I do not think that the provocation piece is strong. The provocation piece is argues that Armenians, Armenians extremist massacres because of their actions with the revolutionary action. Right. And I think that the revolutionary activities of Armenians in the end of the 19th century is very uh, generalized, maximized. It wasn't clear. Because but with the context of the way in which the Ottoman state viewed these activities, there was no Armenians, they viewed all these activities of the non church and exile, everything, you know. And uh, to that extent, intimidation, yes, it's worth to a certain extent. Because Armenians, it's not that all Armenians are, you know, wanted to, you know, revolutionary activities to change the situation, equality, to relieve the Armenians from the burden of their taxes and to uh, fight against the Spotism, but there were all, all, also majority of Armenians who were pro status uh, quo. That they thought that the activities of the revolution is, is endangering their interest in status quo. So it's not clear cut that intimidation uh, worked. Of course, intimidation never worked for the revolutionaries, I think. Their, uh, their, their task was to, uh, you know, to do their best in order to bring a better situation to the Armenians of the provinces. As a matter of fact, in the 1905 the assassination attempt of Abel Hamid II, that's not the, that doesn't show you any intimidation of the Armenian revolution. On the contrary, it shows you how, how the situation is. As a matter of fact, until 1907, 
the Young Church and the Armenian Revolution, and specifically Armenian Revolution Revolution, were not in terms of who, how to bring the change in the Because the Young Church were mostly uh, positivist, gradualist, they did not believe in European intervention or did not believe in revolution to bring about uh, a just solution to the uh, situation in Armenia, but to change or reclaim the constitution in the 1922. So, intimidation did not work, I should say. It escalated the situation more. And, yeah. yeah you want? Yeah, go ahead. And I'll then I'll have the next question we'll take from the QA. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, slow guiding. Um, my dad was on the uh, Asian region. Yes, and uh, and uh, to me, this is a fascinating comparison. Uh, where uh, you know, uh, like around when the uh, Adana massacre was taking place, there was a big uh, military operation in the against the Southern Bashkirs. And the Southern Bashkirs attempted to send their letters to the American consulate in Harbour saying that this is how the situation is. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, or or uh, Masters, I think, the one before. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. No, the, the one before. Oh, one before that one, yeah. That's 1908. Uh, eight. Eight. And they say our situation now is not, it's quite similar to the Armenian situation at the time of the massacre. And I believe that the reference is to the Armenian massacre because it's 1908. But it might as well be developed. So, uh, and in my kind of research, uh, I argue that, you know, there is a historical continuity across the Armenian, the Young Turks, and the Republican period, uh, and it builds up to what happened in this in the later uh, years. But you are using uh, uh, the 1908 uh, regime change as a, a rupture and the, and the revolution. Uh, so I, I wonder how that uh, is like do you are you comfortable using those that as a revolution or as a military coup or um, because when we say revolution and compare it to the French case that I think carry uh, different meaning that a uh, more regime change to a military coup um, that is a different. Yeah, it is considered as a revolution in the field, and I feel it is considered as a revolution. Uh, it was considered as a revolution by the first participants. That's you know, it's also important what they thought about it, how they discussed the French Revolution at the time. So there's a large material, and I discussed in the first book. But in terms of continuing, what I mean in continuing is not that the levels of violence you know, subside, but I do think that it was kind, kind of a larger plan of church in general. Take Armenians and get rid of the Armenians, and that was the final result of the change. Every act of violence was used by him, but they had similar also a commonality in terms of impunity. But also, one thing that shows that in the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, tensions, ethno religious tensions, were so high in the region that any minor or major event could lead to cataclysm and to a level of violence. Because uh, if the country revolution was a trigger in the other massacre, World War One was definitely the trigger for the or is the trigger of the Armenian Church. But people argue that the Yorkshire regime extends from 1908. Yeah, it's true. From 1908 until 1940 or 60 or whatever. You know, uh, because many of the Yorkshire leaders also you know, participated in the regime massacres and came out. There were setbacks, but when Mustafa came out, how that put the new beginning, the, the remnants of the Yorkshire. Uh, now it's up here, the young church become up in Asia now, the remnants of the young church who now purify a uh, high position, all right, within the government. And so there is a continuity of the, of the violent period. But again, I don't think that in, in the case of violent church, I don't think that continuing holds ground that, you know, that, you know, I mean, it's 500 years of suffering, and then this is the end of the, you know, of the young church of the We have a question from um, Professor Sunni. No. All right. It seemed to me that some of your causes, like the public sphere and the counter-revolution, are really context 
in which certain things become possible rather than causes. Um, why not distinguish between context and cause, like those of agents, whereas rumors are meaning acting openly when you should fail to care anyone? That's one question, and then he has uh, the second one also. What a strange name for a newspaper, the PC God, which is more like moderational restraint, becomes an instigation of violence. Can that name be explained? But one thing also we have to understand, is, let's start with the moderation. I mean, here's the thing. Uh, Itidal was never an Arabian until this period, the international country. For example, uh, Armenians were having major land issues in, in Adana. This literally would be, uh, would be, would be a track of land that belonged to the Armenian capital base, which was, uh, which was, uh, uh, designated for the Muslim Mohajir, and then I mean, complained, and then the Iraqi regime, the old regime of Istanbul, that no one, is, uh, no one should be allowed under the Muslim Mohajir, the number of wasn't implemented uh, by the local uh, local governor. And when Armenians uh, uh, put together a demonstration, Adana, he wrote a pro Armenian piece saying it's the right of Armenians to uh, ask for their land. So I don't think. It's the uh, the main arch enemy of the of the Etida was the was the uh, was the uh, and the uh, and the uh, Javid state, the Javid state the governor of uh, of, uh, of Adana and the Akulai, the most of it. is a proper name, I think, because the uh, uh, because the young church vision. Uh, influenced by European uh, progressivism and so progress and the moderation and this and that, it uh, uh, it, it started really you know uh, kind of progressive politics, uh, pro progressive politics. But as a matter of fact, in the post-revolution period, Armenians and Nocturnes would be big parties. But specifically, the Armenian Nocturne, the TUP and the Vashnaks were uh, teamed up in spreading the, the ideas of the institution the literature. So we shouldn't judge the name of Etidad is a, a ex post facto right the, uh, by the mathematics system. It happened over there. And the, uh, regarding the public sphere, uh, I think it is, it should be considered as causes too, because without the public sphere, without the opening of the public sphere, there wasn't any gradualism. And without opening the public sphere, this would not have happened. I think. The rumors would not have spread so fast. The Armenians would not have uh, uh, boasted about their liberty, about their uh, about their uh, about their culture, nationalism, and it wouldn't have really rose the level of emotion among the Muslim population. Openly buying and selling guns, openly doing this and that. So I I I disagree. I think it's much more uh, causes than context. It might be also confident, but I really hope. Um, well, I'll, I'll give it back to you. So, thank you very much for such a fascinating uh, talk. I was wondering, I was particularly interested in the uh, Solution prophecy. Of course, it combines my two favorite things: prophecies and Solution. Um, I, I, I was particularly interested in. Uh, the memory of Cilicia among the Ottoman Muslims. Uh, so um, I know how difficult it must be to sort of keep track of um, how rumors get started in such like a vibrant public sphere. But I was wondering, could you speak a little bit about like how this pro the origin of this prophecy among the Ottoman Muslims and how it gained traction? So I could see how Cilicia would be something really relevant to like the Mukhitaryan monks or yeah. Armenian nationalists, but is Cilician history, was it something well known in the region, even amongst Ottoman Muslims? I'm not sure it was among Ottoman Muslims, but of course, having said all of that, Armenian, we shouldn't deny agency. So Armenian, uh, Armenian revolutionary activities were also vibrant in the region of Cilicia because its ge ge geographical location was very close to Cyprus, from where Armenian uh, revolutionaries were infiltrated into, into, uh, into, uh, into other land, through Mercy and the other land, afterwards, second time for them. But uh, one thing we have to remember also when reading 
the Ottoman documents about these activities of, uh, I would say, a few people, maybe 20 or 40 people, uh, is that there is always kind of the idea there that they are going to hold this and that revolution. But in the context of the of tradition history in the past, I think that people would know about that because it's a little bit history of religion. And once they see it put into written, it wasn't only theater, it was also uh, carrying coat of arms, flags, Venetian coat of arms, flags in the moment of Venetian period, etc., etc. So again, is this cultural nationalism or is this political nationalism? So it's, it's kind of a, it's difficult to find, unless we have a memoir. We have memoirs from the, from, from the period that would think about the tradition. But did every common people in the as a perpetrator knew about the tradition? I, they didn't know what, what was happening. You know, it's like the other day there was a there was a clip on Facebook where people are sitting in a restaurant and three people are jogging and everyone suddenly stands up and starts uh, running after them, thinking that something will happen. The kind of mob mentality. So not everyone is motivated by this sophisticated ideology, you know. Some people want to see it, some people want to take a run, some people's motivations are different. That's why emotions are important in these motivations. Thank you, because for it's, it's a very timely book, and as you said, it's one of those uh, uh, parts of Armenian history that are little known. So I very much uh, appreciate this intervention. We, a lot of us, know about the, the Adana massacre through the writings of the various mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if you can comment, having done all of this uh, research, uh, where do you, where would you place her observation in the aftermath uh, of violence in in light of the archival research that you've done? Now she doesn't seem it to be a history, yeah. rather a testimony or a memoir. I I mentioned her to okay, that's the first time that she entered the she was sent there for 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 aid uh, you know for helping uh, you know uh, help her needs. But also her arrival in Africa provides a lot of clues as to uh, the, the, you know, she describes the situation in a very, very candid manner, the destruction of the church, the destruction of the declaration of the city. But also you get a lot of historical facts about the attention situation in the post Adana period when, uh, when uh, uh, Jamal Bey becomes uh, 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 Jamal Bey becomes the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the governor of Adana, and there is a lot of conflict between her and the governor because Jamal wants to open orphanage, she will hold the Jamal orphanage, hold the orphanage, and she will hold Think about the thousands of orphans. Now we have Armenian orphans and we have some Muslim orphans. And then she even fights against the mission, mission of orphanage. So the Armenian kids should be told about the orphanage. Because the issue is concerned that once they're in an orphanage, they will be taught in their own language of the orphanage, and they will be taught German, British, or English, or it's French, and then they lose their kind of, uh, kind of, uh, their sense of identity. But also we see that this is all possible now, because of the police field, because of the new situation, criticizing the government, criticizing the, uh, the work of relief. This is all possible in the post-revolution period. That's why the post-revolution period is a double-edged sword, right? You know? And if you ask me, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of revolution. I think gradualism is the way to go to the thing. If you look into the past the decades where revolutions are created, you know, we think that it's a good thing to go. That's why I think uh, her testimony is extremely important to support. I think her, uh, her book in the ruins is a major, major contribution to the literary, uh, literary, uh, description or reaction to the Ottoman Massacre. It's a gem in the literary world. But for a historian, she also provides a lot of important facts there. So no, you know, that's why we have to include every voice. And in this project, I also provide a voice to everyone's voice. If a Muslim notable thought that Armenians were responsible, then I, I gave them both. Because it's important to understand why people thought the same way as they, they have thought, how they see the emotions play an important role, their anger and frustration. But that does not what you have to. Thank you. Thank you.
one important thing that we have to do is also check the map to show the investability of the event. What do you mean by the event? Or justification. Let me do my privilege and also ask um, a, a question then that would take us back to the, the question about the public here. Um, please, yeah, very much the focus on each adult as the one of the um, basically the essential agent in that yeah. in, in, in that realm. But it makes it makes me curious. On one hand, can you talk about sort of the recipient? Um the, the audience of each adult is it for is it read beyond other is it read in Islam? And is there anybody on the local scene pushing back? Um do we know anything? I mean, do those incendiary articles, do they receive any kind of um the young local? I don't think so. Yeah. Because it wasn't only it, yeah. I mean there are four or five newspapers to go over. There is Yeni uh there is Feyhan, a uh, newspaper which caused very difficult to find. They were, they were, we don't just do by checking them. The only thing is now they publish the if you got a newspaper, I found copies of it at Hoover Institute around uh, 10 years ago, and then this is the two years ago they published all the Israel papers they took by uh, Kuno, and then uh, finally I found the whole collection, the original of the collection, and it's important, and uh, uh, to that extent, all in the investigation commission, that's what said, testified to the impact of the Israel Now there are two quote-unquote loose ends in this whole story. One of them, the telegram that was sent by the under secretary, Hakim Bey, the body, saying that, hey, Kale, be, be careful to make sure that we think our protected. And the second one is the real question as to why the Ottoman soldiers were sent to other countries to protect and keep order participated in the, in the massacre. Now, not all soldiers. We have to be very careful. Many soldiers who protect our land. But there are soldiers who participated with the Russians, with the mob, etc., and lose it. Now, why? And here comes to the investigation commission again. And in the book, I provide multiple, multiple explanations. One says, for example, uh, the, when they camped, uh, the Armenians fired at them from the uh, from the bell tower in the Armenian church, in the Armenian culture, to, to create more problems and eventually allow the European insurrection. Another says that, you know, the church did it. They fired on the Armenians in order to, they fired on the, sorry, on the, on the, on the soldiers and claimed that Armenians fired it in order to start the second wave. Other says that, rumors spread around that the Armenians have attacked the soldiers in the Armenian culture and killed them. And then all the other soldiers came in. So these are parts of the investigation. When the investigation commission comes comes in, they start measuring the distance between the Armenian culture and the Muslim culture, or the, or the place where the, the the soldiers camp. And they see that there's a there's a major kind of hill, but it was impossible for an Armenian to fire from the from the uh, from the bell tower from the from the uh, on the Iran the soldiers came. There was always there was a point. Other people say, well, uh, these soldiers came with preconceived notions that the Armenians are always dangerous and they have to really uh, you know um, uh, teach them a lesson and so forth. So again this issue has not been clear to me. I only provide here the uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the explanation of the investigation commission who said that uh, they came with preconceived notions some did participate in the massacres where others didn't. Uh, and the reason motivation is that it was for a financial gain. Um, I just have a question out of curiosity. Uh, you, you found this right now uh, and scholarships throw these ossified categories of you know, essentialized Muslim versus Christian violence. Um, and of course, also like trickles down from scholarship into public schools and um, the way that people learn about other yeah. Um So I'm curious, could you describe um, what it's been like writing the book and talking to people about it? Um, 
on a more popular level, either in you know presentations you've made or uh, I assume you've met with different teachers and educators. Um, what kinds of conversations come out of this sort of complicating process? This is the third. This is the third program oh, winning actually. No. Uh, I don't travel a lot, so but, uh, this is the third uh, program winning. Uh, and uh, uh, and the, you know, there's another book that was published on the same topic, which I haven't read, the Jai Bujur's book. Bujur uh, is a denialist of Bajin genocide, so, uh, so it's, I think it's, it's, it's uh, a few years that it was part of my life. But uh, there were actually, towards the end of the, the, during the war, actually, the British did approach. I mean, the Basin and other places, uh, inciting them to uprise against the Armenians, against the Ottomans, for the, uh, in lieu of an independent Armenian section. Of course, uh, the local notables refused to cooperate with them, but also think of it the way in which Europeans abused and resorted. The French, the British, uh, the Jean Dorian, for example, etc. Everyone said in the comments, but maybe that is the Arabs will be accused to everyone. A prize will promise you will get something good after that. No, nothing happened. Writing the book has been very difficult, I should say. It took me eight years to finish it, because this is not only my job in my family, and I have to have a university, uh, university and obligation teaching and other research projects too at the same time. But, uh, uh, it was, it, I think it was difficult because we had to, uh, at the historian, we had to detach yourself from the material, and uh, we had to try to be as much as objective as we can, but there's no objectivism, I think, objectivism, or objectivism. People claim that they're objective historians, there's no such objectivism. So we all have our definitions, our biases, but as historians, we try to make the utmost out of it by interpreting in a better and sound manner, and I wish and hope in uh, the future other people will come and provide better explanation to the other members. But what I did, I, I, I put it in a global context to try to provide that this aid, this Madid massacres will even cover in the Omaha World Bee, for example, Kansas, any other, every, every city around the globe covered the other massacres. But then it went to only a week with the other nations. And it's important, I think, because these types of massacres do take place in history, not only the past, but the present and the future. So, I would like to see that. Yeah, yeah I, um, I have this uh, question about uh, the relationship between uh, rebellion and massacre, because I, I deal with the same kind of concept. And, uh, do you see that as Happened in other cases of violence against the Armenians, or is it only that like, you, you are focused on the Adama case, for example, like in earlier cases? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, uh, the, uh, again, the state has its own, its own uh, euphemism also, but its own uh, terminology. Every state has their own terminology. If they apply the event, or they think it endanger their rules. Authority. So if it's a massacre and there are victims, then it's a riot for the state. It's an uprising for the state. It's the riot uprising. So again, I'm not surprised that that's that the continuation of the terminology of the state. So Isidal or uh, or you know or Christian. Uh, 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 Christian is the most important word to understand. And, uh, and disturbances. But also, if you read the Ottoman document, there is also kind of uh, blurriness. We call it Ehali blurriness for everyone. So, who is, who is the Ehali here? You don't know. You know. Are they Armenians? Are they not Armenians? You know. The Ehali were killed. Someone Ehali were killed. Oh, are Ehali in peace? Oh, yes. so, who is the Ehali in peace? So, it's, it's the way in which, that's why, you know. Being obsessed with Ottoman documents, that would mean as such should be the Ottoman documents with the destruction of them. Because Ottoman documents are important, I think, but they provide state, state point of view. And my first book was not based on this, was based on Ottoman documents that were other archives. So the first book 
aimed at providing a, 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 a challenging resolution, aimed at demonstrating how the others perceive the object resolution and what it meant for the real resolution. Basically, Jews and Hebrew, Ladino, Armenian, Arab, uh, uh, many other groups. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, sure, and we should probably lift. Uh, this was off the book. Sure, sure. Uh, this question is also more of a curiosity. It's, it's probably outside the scope of this project, but do you know if after the massacres, if the cotton industry was adversely affected? Yes, it was affected, but then it started to rise eventually. I mean, think about it. I mean, Jennifer was a huge, huge load of water in the economy. We start with the boycott, boycott in the year in the 1917, the Balkan War, and then but the uh, determination of the Armenian, uh, Armenian property, property occasionally was, uh, was a blow, but at the same, at the same time, they were important role in the emerging tradition. But here you have cotton, I mean, we have to think about also cotton as this white thing, but it is painted as white, so it's, it's, it's important to uh, because then the, it, it, people would ask why Adana and why not other colors, but you know, because you see, I, I argue that economy is an important aspect. So the discounter is a uh, migrant worker and the uh, accumulation has to make the average worker in the world this time. But, but one thing we have to understand is that nightwalkers could not be described in a monocultural, in a monocultural, or multiple countries. Thank you very much.